welcome to Vibrant Hong Kong. I'm Rico. And I'm Erica. Good evening, everyone. Erica, would you agree that wearing jewelry is a way of adding a touch of sophistication and making a person stand out from the crowd? Definitely. That's exactly why I keep a collection that caters to every occasion. In 1947, a diamond company came up with the classic tagline, a diamond is forever. Named the slogan of the century by Advertising Age, it's one of the most successful marketing campaigns of all time. Now, dealing in jewelry and gems is a lucrative business. As a commercial hub that frequently plays host to international trade fairs, Hong Kong is a hotspot where members of this industry gather to explore business opportunities. Jewelry and Gem the World Hong Kong, the world's premier B2B fine jewelry event, brings together over 3,000 suppliers from 44 countries and regions, showcasing a global selection of exquisite jewelry and gems. This year marks this 40th edition of this trade extravaganza, where beauty, innovation, and endless business opportunities abound. The fair serves as the ultimate platform facilitating international trade and fostering exchange within the jewelry sector in this vibrant city of Hong Kong. We will see some very unique pieces that uh, they are not uh, mass produced, they are very, one of a kind, and a period pieces from uh, Art Nouveau, Art Deco period, and uh, one from the Victorian period. So we go through history together. Hong Kong is a place that everybody's coming to meet and uh, it's connecting the Chinese culture and the international uh, culture. So it's very important for, not only for us, for all of the people I think that are attending the exhibition. It's one of the biggest exhibitions in the world. We focus on craftsmanship and we focus on per perfection. And so every single piece we make is truly unique. A lot of international buyers come to Hong Kong and Hong Kong being a vibrant city, it brings a lot of people together and having a lot of people in one spot is always good and uh, such a place to showcase our jewellery. The gems and jewellery sector is crucial for driving exports, with India being a prominent player. Jewels Unbounded, a marvelous fashion spectacle, was unveiled tonight with the support of the Consulate General of India in Hong Kong. In addition to fostering trade relations and partnerships between India and Hong Kong, the event also creates new opportunities for innovation and growth in this thriving sector. If natural diamonds or lab-grown diamonds, precious or semi-precious stones, gold or silver jewelry, India is a world leader in all. Gems and jewellery are the mainstay of Indian commodity exports to Hong Kong. Uh, I would say that gems and jewellery uh, constitute about 90% of Indian commodity exports to Hong Kong. For example, in the last financial year, uh, our total exports of commodities to exp uh, Hong Kong were about $9.8 billion US dollars. And out of that, uh, the gems and jewellery constituted about 8.7. Uh, US billion dollars. So it's like literally 90%. So that is why it is very important for us to showcase the strengths of the Indian gems jewelry sector. Can you also provide some insights on the current state of trade between Hong Kong and India in the gem and jewelry industry? This week is a very opportune time uh, given the fact that Hong Kong is seeing the convergence of buyers and sellers of Indian gems and jewelry from all over the world. Uh, Hong Kong is a super connector which means that it has unique strengths in terms of its uh, English-speaking population, its openness to different cultures, different nationalities. The Indian connection in Hong Kong goes back at least 200 years. So the Indian trading heritage with Hong Kong goes back a long way. And I think we can just build upon that further uh, to make sure that Hong Kong is also able to utilize its strengths of being a super connector to help build India-Hong Kong trade. As much as the gem and jewellery sector is about trade and commerce, its essence lies in capturing life's most precious moment. Symbolizing love and commitment, as well as embodying cherished memories, each bejeweled beauty carries immeasurable worth. This Sunday is National Day. Its proximity to the Mid-Autumn Festival this year means that mainlanders will be getting eight days off in the upcoming Super Golden Week. An influx of visitors is expected to drive up consumption in Hong Kong.
The National Day Fireworks display will be returning after a five-year absence and is scheduled to take place at 9 p.m. on Sunday. Rico, you don't need to worry too much about Hong Kong's ability to return to normalcy. Our city recorded preliminary visitor arrivals of about 4.1 million for August, which is equivalent to 84 percent of pre-pandemic levels. The hotel industry is also showing signs of a significant recovery, with the average occupancy rate exceeding 80 percent in June. What's more, the government has launched a series of measures to attract tourists and encourage local consumption, such as the Night Vibes Hong Kong campaign. As tourist numbers continue to grow, the hotel industry has an increasingly important role to play. The sector says that it will offer special dining and travel deals in support of the Night Vibes Hong Kong campaign. And today, we have invited Mr. Casper Choi, the Executive Director of the Federation of Hong Kong Hotel Owners, to share about the latest developments in the hotel industry with us. Hello, Casper. Welcome. Welcome. Now, with the National Day Fireworks Display making a comeback this year, what kind of occupancy rates are you expecting for the hotels in the busier districts? And also, are the current bookings reflective of your predictions? Well, I, I think the, um, the national holiday, it's always been the busy season for our hotel industry. Uh, we expect at least a 90% uh, upwards uh, occupancy in the really uh, tourist uh, uh, districts, uh, especially like in the uh, Tim Sachui area, Wan Chai uh, area as well. Uh, I think the firework is, is that extra boost of energy that uh, the tourist industry really needed. So we, we're really happy that the government is giving focus, uh, especially the Night Vibes campaign that's going to really drive not only the tourists uh, coming to Hong Kong as well as the local residents' consumption as well. Mm, that's really good to know. Yeah, I understand that the hotel industry is offering a series of deals in promoting the Night Vibes Hong Kong campaign. So what message do you want to bring to the tourists who are already in the city or those that are planning to visit? Well, uh, book early uh, <laughs> and uh, Hong Kong has lots to offer. Besides the firework and the Night Vibes uh, campaign, uh, Hong Kong has a great variety of content that we have all to offer. Uh, not only the, the cultural uh, 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 contents like the West Kowloon uh, Cultural District. Uh, we also have the uh, nature uh, part of Hong Kong that I think uh, a lot of people are, are just uh, rediscovering that Hong Kong has. Uh, as well, I think, um, not to forget uh, the Hong Kong dining culture. Uh, we have lots of Michelin stars, uh, restaurants. Uh, so yes, come to Hong Kong and, and really experience it uh, for yourself. Definitely, so make sure you book early. Yeah, for travel foodies, that is definitely very important. Now, various industries are trying to stimulate nighttime consumption lately. For example, a number of malls and restaurants are offering discounts. So what do you envision for the development of Hong Kong's night economy? And how can we create a vibrant nighttime atmosphere? Well, I, I think it's um, for everybody to get really back to the normal. Uh, we used to stay out uh, until midnight. And I think it's the vibe that we need to really uh, get everybody uh, back uh, and stay stay out instead of you know, ordering takeout and watching steaming uh, a video at home. Uh, it, it's that atmosphere that, that is really different. Uh, I think uh, in the coming months, uh, we will uh, work together with the government uh, to how to connect all the tourist points. I think in the past, uh, we have been uh, very good in promoting the, uh, the, the spots, but we're not really connecting them. So I think the, with the Night Vibe campaign, uh, we would try to work with the government and the district and, and different industry to connect the points so people go to, um, say, any two spots. Uh, we would drive them and, and, and plan a, a good uh, walking tour uh, and uh, uh, bring them back to uh, the shops, the restaurants and the hotels uh, to really enjoy the full content that we have to offer. Um, so I would like to know, in terms of um, the hotel industry, what role do you think do the hotel actually plays in stimulating the customer experience? Well, I, I think hotel uh, plays a very important role because we're one of the first um, uh, a point that a tourist will, will, will get to connect when they arrive in Hong Kong. Um, the hotel industry is very special because uh, we really pride ourselves on our service quality. And this is one reason why we are very confident that the tourists will come back to Hong Kong, not just the mainlanders. Uh, we're attracting also, uh, besides the, the, the leisure uh, tourists, uh, the corporate tourists as well. Because Hong Kong, we do have lots of uh, major meetings, conferences, events. Uh, that's going to attract travelers, uh, especially the corporate side, uh, to Hong Kong. 
Uh, and this is something that I think uh, many of the neighboring cities uh, or countries uh, cannot offer. Um, so, like you said, I think um, the Hong Kong uh, Hotel, uh, it's going to be our big ambassador uh, uh, to give our tourists a, a very welcoming uh, experience. Just a quick follow-up, um, what opinions have the hotels expressed to you about, you know, so far the current situation? Well, I think um, they are very excited uh, because uh, since, uh, you know, everything is you know, getting back to normal, uh, we're preparing ourselves uh, to receive uh, the tourists coming back to Hong Kong. And uh, we hope that giving them this uh, really enjoyable experience, they can also be the ambassador to the, you know, tell the world how great Hong Kong uh, continue to be one of the best destinations uh, in the world. Uh, so yes, we are very excited. Casper, let's delve into the way people travel nowadays. Um, the way that people travel, I'm sure, has drastically changed since the pandemic because online retail is so commonplace now, they might prefer off-the-beaten-track experiences or cultural tourism over shopping. What tourist needs have you observed in the post-COVID era and have their accommodation requirements changed? The tourist uh, habit has changed slightly, uh, but the uh, demand uh, for quality products and uh, services have not changed. Uh, so this is, this is why I am not uh, too concerned about the, the change of habit, because, uh, you know, tourists change the habit uh, constantly. Uh, it's whether or not we have that uh, full content and deep content that we can continue to offer. Like you said, um, going to experience the cultural uh, scene that we have, not just uh, going to the museums, uh, but the uh, list of um, uh, cultural events uh, that we have to offer, uh, along with the new products uh, that we can sell along with that service, uh, we are not really worried. I think uh, tourists coming back to Hong Kong are telling us uh, they don't have enough time to experience everything. Uh, that we have to offer. So we want to try to present them uh, with the next trip <laughs> so they can come back again. Mm -hmm. It sounds like there's a lot of variety and it sounds very promising too. Yeah, I mean, the hotel industry has always been very competitive. Now, there's so many online platforms now that um, offers alternative options like guest house and apartments and stuff. So how do you see this competition? And do you think the hotels here still have enough appeal? Um, definitely. Like I said, Hong Kong's hotels uh, offer the greatest service, uh, you know, top-notch uh, in the world. Uh, well, yes, you know, you have different type of travelers, and I think this is the beauty of Hong Kong. Uh, for the back, uh, packers, you know, they have, you know, different variety and options. And of course, uh, uh, that is also a concern that I need to raise. I mean, uh, some illegal, uh, you know, accommodation services, you know, the government need to really focus on that. Uh, but putting that aside, I think in Hong Kong, we have the different types of hotels that actually suits all types of tourists. So I think this is really our strength. Mm -hmm. There are various hotels and good ones to offer. <laughs> yes, so there are a lot of people who are concerned about travel costs, including myself. So hotels around the world slashed prices during the pandemic to attract tourists and customers. But now that normal life has resumed, what are the prices like? And have they returned to pre-COVID levels or is the industry exercising some kind of degree of restraint? Well, I think um, the transparency is, is very high. Uh, you can just go online and you can compare the, the pricing uh, as well as the quality of service. I think what we sell in Hong Kong is not the, the pricing, but the quality of service. Mm -hmm. uh, people come to Hong Kong knowing that what uh, they are going to get and they chose Hong Kong for that reason. Uh, so I think in, in, in the future, uh, we need to continue to stay competitive with the rich content that we have. We need to organize more major events uh, just to attract uh, our tourists uh, coming to Hong Kong for that specific reason. Uh, so yes, I am I'm very encouraged by uh, you know, the list of activities that are already planned, not just for this year, but already planning for next year. Mm -hmm. All right, so I mean, let's talk a little bit about the human resources because the government's enhanced supplementary labor scheme began accepting applications in early September to allow employers to import workers in 26 different sectors. So what's the labor shortage situation like in the industry right now and how has it impacted the hotel services? Yes, um, earlier uh, in, in, in the middle uh, June or July uh, period, we did a survey uh, with our uh, hotel industry. We're short of about $9 thousand uh, practitioners right now. Uh, so we are really glad that the uh, government had listened to uh, our really needs and concerns uh, to continue to maintain that high level of service. Uh, 
Uh, the application process has, has begun uh, uh, recently in early uh, September. Uh, so we hope to get the, uh, the manpower that we need probably uh, early next year. Uh, but uh, continued uh, uh, long-term wise, I think uh, import of labor is not the really solution. We need to really find a new population policy where we can attract the talents that we need. Mm. So could you elaborate a little bit more on what hopes do you have for the scheme? Well, uh, well they are doing a great job already, uh, engaging uh, our owners and employers. So we want to really uh, find the talents that we need uh, so that we can uh, bring our uh, service uh, back to normal. Uh, right now, we are facing the shortage of uh, manpower, so uh, our hotel are not able to open to our maximum uh, capacity at the moment. Hmm. Continuing on the subject, it obviously costs more to hire foreign workers than local ones. So how many workers does the industry plan on importing and what positions are they expected to fill in? Well, um, the uh, biggest shortage uh, are, are the frontline staff. Basically, the front counters when we were first receive our gas, you know, the, uh, uh, the staff that is tidying the rooms and all the, also the catering as well. Uh, that seems to be the biggest shortage also uh, across uh, the other services sectors as well. Uh, uh, early indication that we may be looking for about 2,000, uh, but uh, like I said, uh, we hope to actually find more local workforce uh, coming back to work uh, uh, for our hotel industry as well, because they will be able to provide the highest uh, uh, service and the long-term service that we need to maintain that uh, quality. What kind of training will be given to ensure that they provide the quality services? Well, um, Hong Kong's hotel service is one of the uh, highest uh, in the world. Uh, so we have uh, great training staff uh, and training programs within the hotel, as well as the education and training institutions. Uh, they are also providing that service as well. So uh, we're glad that Hong Kong has all this infrastructure ready. Uh, it's the manpower that we need, but uh, we're seeing uh, uh, the light at the end of the tunnel already. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to know. Now, mainland tourists make up the majority of visitors to Hong Kong. So do you think that our city can attract travelers outside of this demographic? And what suggestions does the hotel industry have with respect to this? We're seeing less uh, international travelers coming back to Hong Kong due to the uh, capacity issue from, for example, the uh, airline side. Uh, right now in the summer, uh, they're only at about 55% capacity. Uh, the manpower issue has really uh, helped them uh, trying to get the flights back to Hong Kong, uh, but we're looking at maybe less than 70% at the end of the year. Mm. Uh, we're doing a lot of promotion overseas, uh, and we're just uh, showing the world that what we have to offer. And I think, again, the best ambassadors would be the travelers coming to Hong Kong uh, this year, because they're going to spread the good words. Well, thank you so much, Casper, for sharing your insights on the hotel industry with us. Now, making a good impression is definitely essential when receiving tourists. And being able to communicate with them in their native language is one way of winning them over. The European Union office to Hong Kong and Macau recently held an event called Speak Dating, which gave the public an opportunity to discover 12 European languages for free. To celebrate the European Day of Languages, the European Union office to Hong Kong and Macau held an event called Speak Dating at a shopping mall in Kowloon Tong. Thomas Nyaki, head of the EU office to Hong Kong and Macau, officiated the kickoff ceremony alongside several consulates general. It's a day where we celebrate the linguistic and cultural diversity that we have in Europe, the Speak Dating uh, event, which is one of the key public diplomacy activities of the EU office. Lessons in 12 European languages, including French, German, Italian and Spanish, were on offer at the event. Members of the public were invited to learn some hand-picked words and phrases in a three-minute session at each language booth, after which they would get a stamp in their booklet. So it's time to pick a booth. Hmm, I guess I'll start with Germans as I'm a fan of their football team. Hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. hi. How do I say hi in German? Hello. 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 Wie geht's? Is how are you? Wie geht's? 
Wie geht's? Perfect. Wie geht's? Is how are you? What? Quatsch. Nonsense. Nonsense. Oh, Nonsense. I would like you. <laughs> This is very interesting. Even though the lesson only lasted three minutes, I was able to pick up some greetings quite quickly under the tutor's instructions. Let's go to the next booth. Speak Dating is a project of the European Union Office to Hong Kong and Macau and the European Union National Institutes for Culture in Hong Kong. Held in collaboration with numerous European consulates general in Hong Kong, it points out the many benefits of language learning, such as how it can break down cultural barriers and open the door to new friendships and professional opportunities. Uh, we learn German, German, German French, French, French. Because, because, like, because well, it's like a native French. language in German as well. We can cope with people who like don't necessarily like master English or like yeah have other languages. And we can broaden our horizons with languages as like some languages are very similar to each other. There are many Europeans in, in Hong Kong. Um, there are over 1,600 European Union companies in, in Hong Kong. The arts, uh, culture, in uh, food and beverage. So, so there, there are very many Europeans. So, so you, you will hear different European languages around the city as well. By doing this event, we, we hope the Hong Kong public can learn more about uh, different European languages, perhaps the ones they don't know. I can't help but think that I've seen your surname in the menu or two. Does knowing how to pronounce your name mean that I can order this particular dish in a restaurant? Gnocchi is a famous Italian pasta dish. And it's, uh, there are many restaurants in Hong Kong, Italian restaurants in Hong Kong that have served gnocchi. So, so you'll see this around town, uh, this particularly di delicious dish, I would say. With over 800 visitors attending the event each year, Speak Dating has drawn participation from more than 4,500 people to date. Learning is a lifelong journey, and the knowledge we acquire will last us a lifetime. Even if we don't become fluent in a foreign language, we can still acquaint ourselves with the culture and history of different countries in the process. In addition to jewelry and jams, timepieces are also another popular collector's item. If you're a watch enthusiast, you won't want to miss this next exhibition. The Hong Kong Watch and Clock Fair, as well as Salon de TE, which took place earlier this month, showcased a diverse range of watch brands and the exquisite craftsmanship of the world's top timepiece manufacturers. It might surprise you to learn that Hong Kong is a world-leading exporter of watches and clocks. The largest export category is battery or accumulator-powered wristwatches, accounting for 37% of total exports in 2022. Wristwatch exports range from analog to digital, metal to plastic, fashion to classic, standard to jewelry, and novelty to sports watches. Hong Kong's watch and clock enterprises are keen to move up market. They're looking to develop locally designed and produce mechanical movements and even start mass production of chronometers. A series of forums was held in conjunction with the event to facilitate exchanges between local and international industry members. Let's see what the latest market trends are in this space. The world's leading timepiece event attracting overseas and local exhibitors to showcase a broad range of timepieces as well as providing a one-stop uh, marketing and sourcing platform and for exhibitors and buyers to meet, network and explore business opportunities. From renowned brands to visionary artisans, the 42nd Hong Kong Trade Development Council, HKTDC Hong Kong Watch and Clock Fair and 11th Salon de TE brought together over 700 exhibitors from 17 countries and regions, showcasing a diverse range of timepieces and craftsmanship from the world's finest watchmakers. Embracing the Guo Chao National Wave theme, this year's Salon de TE paid tribute to Chinese tradition and cultural splendor. 
a local brand unveiled their latest collection of tourbillon watches at the fair. Blending the art of Chinese wood carving with Western watchmaking techniques, these exquisite timepieces manifest a unique fusion of cultures. When I start my own brand, my Toby own brand, I want to start as a Hong Kong brand because I think the charisma of Hong Kong can be fully exposed by the merge of the East and art essence. And we have a lot of elements and a lot of IPs that we can put into the design to show that for Hong Kong, we have a lot of charisma to the world. We use a lot of our revenue uh, and also our resources all put into the R&D development. We very focus on the function and also the craftsmanship and also the mechanism of our tourbillon. I hope to express this Hong Kong spirit uh, in my watch design. So that's why uh, we have different types of the celebrities. We have different types of the Hong Kong iconic, um, uh, different fields of legends. Uh, I want to share about their spiritual story, how they keep working hard, how they keep fighting on to achieve their dreams. I think it's also representing the dreams of Hong Kong. Over 130 prominent brands and designer collections from around the world were presented at Solanda TE across five thematic zones. One of the highlights was the exquisite craftsmanship of independent Swiss watchmakers who are renowned for their distinctive designs and delicate workmanship. The exhibition is very important and Hong Kong is even more important because Asia is the market of the future. Uh, Hong Kong is extremely uh, potential in the watch industry uh, and the clients of all Asia are visiting Hong Kong. Uh, and uh, finally, the small watchmakers like us who, who do a small quantity of products and beautiful things have a chance to be here and show the products. I am from Geneva, the exports of Switzerland. Geneva represents 50% of all the sales of the exports in the world. It's that why the most of the big brands are coming from Geneva. Between Geneva and uh, the watchmakers, it's a love story of 500 years. So I think this passion continues even with the small brands, with what we do. And uh, personally, about my watches, we are going more in the classic way, uh, stylish things, automatic one made in Geneva, so this is our way. The two events served as platforms for making business connections and exploring global trends, with seminars and networking opportunities providing valuable market insights into the dynamics of the watch and clock industry. Our next guest is a rising star of the local watch and clock industry who hopes to take his made in Hong Kong timepieces global. Let's welcome Queen Lai, founder of a customized mechanical watch brand. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome, Quinn. Now, I know that there's a special story behind your passion in watches. Could you share us uh, more about it and also tell us how it sparked your interest in timepieces? Okay. I think, like most people, um, I learned to appreciate things after I lost something. <laughs> So my, my dad gave me a watch when I was in high school. And then that was a, um, it, was, it was a very special gift for me. I, I like things that move. And it was like a, one of those that kind of had a little rotor at the back that can charge the watch. So I really liked it. And one day I went to play basketball. And then by the time I'm done with basketball, the watch was no longer there. So um, that was unfortunate. Um, the watch was stolen. And then I remember, okay, that day I thought, okay, my dad can just get me another one. Right, like all spoiled kids. But then after a while, then I realized, okay, my dad couldn't find the same watch again. Then I start to feel like, okay, interesting. It's a watch, it tells time, but then I somehow had such a relationship with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's when I started looking into this a bit more, and then over time I learned to like watches a bit more. I know that you have a background of engineering, so how did you merge your technical expertise and your love for horology to establish your own brand, and how did you acquire necessary skills and knowledge to make watches? I guess like while it started from watches, I actually ended up doing more like rocket science. <laughs> it's, it's kind of fun, so I, I did some like superhero stuff, it's almost, it's my, my professor and I, we were working on exoskeletons that allows human to jump off from fourth floor to the ground without hurting themselves. 
So we had to study cat motions and how that we can help people to do some superhero moves. It was, I guess it's the experience of learning how to tackle problems, to understand things that originally I thought was out of my reach. And then I kind of went that way to look for things, to have that muscle kind of built. And eventually my passion of watches kind of came back. So I started with buying components off online marketplaces and then trying different builds and breaking a lot of things along the way, obviously. Um, and eventually I started buying components from Swiss factories. So small, um, I wouldn't say factories, but small workshops. And then I buy from those watchmakers some unique components that they made. And then I ended up asking them, okay, how would you best recommend me to put this together? And how can I service this watch? Mm -hmm. Or at one point, it slowly evolved into how can I modify your component or how can I upgrade your component? So as that progress went on, it was over like a four or five year period, I guess. I did it over weekends. I helped my friends build watches. It was fun. I built my own, like I built some watches for myself, did some wedding gifts and it's over the time, kind of, it's my hobby and weekends and kind of built the experience and expertise. Um, just wondering, um, what motivated you to turn your hobby into a startup business? So this is not a practical decision. It's an emotional decision. Mm -hmm. And I decided to go with my passion because I like watches. I like building unique gifts and I like looking at people appreciating the gifts that I make for them. So it's, it's, it almost changed my personality and my, and my priority in, in, in everything almost. Mm -hmm. Then what if I can have, I can let more people enjoy this at a price point that's cheaper. So I was looking into that and then starting to think, okay, how can I integrate technology? How can I integrate um, digital marketing? How can I do a new brand? And that's how uh, my business came about. Fascinating. <laughs> yes. So why is Made in Hong Kong label significant to your brand? And how does being based in the city contribute to its distinctiveness? Huh. I think uh, this whole thing, I, I guess like there is a very practical answer that I can, I can give you like point one, two, three, four, five. But at the end of the day is what I want to do. It's home, right? Practically speaking, a Swiss made watch is easier and cheaper than a Hong Kong made watch. But to do it in Hong Kong, um, in fact, I think since the 50s, there hasn't been anyone who actually did something like this. So when we were calling, no one could tell us what to do. So to do a made in Hong Kong brand is actually really difficult. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's uh, when I really wanted to do it, the part of me is kind of the stupid side of me, wanted to really just, okay, forget about all the problems and do it. Um, but realistically speaking, it was quite a challenge. <laughs> we can feel the burning passion already <laughs> yes, in real life. Yes, and I feel there's a different kind of um, nostalgic element yeah, in, in the concept of it. Um, see a lot of beautiful things these years. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I th in a way, I feel like the worse the world is, the better you see in the different people. So as we notice that, and it's, it's also my team, my team is very young. So a lot of 20 something years old. These young people, their unrealistic passion, that's kind of also pushing me forward. And that's the spirit that's behind the things I'm doing now. And I actually want to know more about the business side. So when creating your own mechanical wash movement, what considerations did you have to take into account regarding the cost and manufacturing processes? And how did you ensure quality and affordability? Um, I know for a fact that people who, who care about Hong Kong, who likes mechanical watches, our product, it's probably very high on their consideration list but I still need to let them know. And just to do this is very difficult. Um, so if I cannot shrink the cost in the component or, the, or making the watch or the operation required, the labor required, then I need to make the marketing super efficient. So that's kind of my mindset um, around doing this, um, mm -hmm. this whole online business. So how did you overcome the challenges of starting a watch brand outside of Switzerland, the epicenter of watchmaking? I think uh, Swiss, so there, there, are, there are actually quite a few Swiss related, I guess, um, concepts for, for watch brands in general. Mm -hmm. It can be Swiss made, it can be made in Switzerland, that can be different. It can be a Swiss brand that's not made in Switzerland. But with all that said, right, um, anything with a Swiss label is worth a bit more. So for watches in specific, um, the way I look into it, it's actually the real value in why people are putting certain things on their wrist. Um, it's a personal statement, right? You, you wear a watch, it can be a conversation starter as well. Um, it tells people about yourself. Um, 
I would think the worst you can do is to pr put a price tag on here. Mm. So, but a lot of people are doing that. They basically wear their watches to show people how much they're worth. Um, but I would hope that the world would change on that aspect. The custom watches that I make would be like on the story of relationships. So the watches would now, instead of saying like how much this person is, is worth, it would be like, oh, my girlfriend made me this watch. Like this took her how many hours and then it, there was a scratch on there. I could see it, but no problem. I love mm -hmm. her, right? It's this kind of story. Then all of a sudden the value is different from, oh, it's one of those, right? Why don't you have one extra zero behind it? <laughs> and then like now the made in Hong Kong one, it's obviously a Hong Kong identity. As a watchmaker who lives in Hong Kong, who loves Hong Kong, I know I'm wearing something that I, that I tell my own story as well. So with this kind of direction, then we can try to establish a brand that's outside of traditional Swiss brands or the main sought after fashion designer brands. Mm -hmm. So that's how I felt like there's a space that we could um, try and give it a go. Mm -hmm. But does your ambition would foresee that uh, the made in Hong Kong brand would be around the same value as like made in Switzerland kind of in the market? If it can catch up to a Swiss brand value, amazing. Like then it becomes sustainable. We can actually encourage more craftsmen. We can, we can work with other designers. We can do collaborations. We can bring up the whole Hong Kong design scene. Like that's a dream, mm -hmm. right? Now you know. Drawing um, to the end of our interview, I do want to ask you: What are your predictions for the upcoming trends in the watch industry? And also, I mean, how do you plan to leverage Hong Kong's unique positioning for international expansion? I have to say, I'm not super optimistic. I think it's a very difficult road ahead. Because um, watch industry-wise, Hong Kong expertise has always been on the the repair, the servicing, the OEM side of things. So we we are like the screwdrivers. Other people are the people who figure out what they're building. So we are very capable screwdrivers, but here's the problem. If someone else come up with a cheaper screwdriver, then the original one gets replaced. Mm. So that's why a lot of factories are having trouble these days. So the watch industry cannot be over-reliant on just OEM without brands and just repair and servicing without our own craftsmanship. So it's going to, it's going to take some efforts to, to, to get out of this cycle. On the flip side of the story is that Hong Kong has all the elements needed. From skills um, to, well, except movement making apparently, so that's what we had to figure out. But then from case making, components making, sourcing, designing on, um, and, and if you think about it, the only one place in the world that can actually capture the full um, China supply chain and at the same time have the full capability in entering all the social media around the world and actually not just to access it, but to know how to use it and grow up using it, mm -hmm. then it's Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So Hong Kong is the best place for this. Um, pieces, like all the components is there. Now, it's whether someone can put that together. Mm -hmm. I'm so sure you to. still <laughs> have a lot more stories or experience to tell us. Um, thank you so much for sharing your watchmaking journey with us tonight. And we wish you every success in your Made in Hong Kong brand, reaching more watch lovers around the world and putting our city on the map. Thank you. I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> now, another way to let more people from all over the world know about Hong Kong is by promoting our local customs. The Taihang Fire Dragon Dance, which is traditionally held during Mid-Autumn Festival, returned in full force after a three-year suspension due to the pandemic. Let's experience this festive ritual steeped in Hong Kong culture together. <laughs> This magnificent fire dragon, skillfully crafted using pearl grass, stretches an impressive 220 feet in length. It's adorned with 12,000 incense sticks and requires more than 200 people to participate. The giant fire dragon weaves through the streets, shining brightly under the night sky. This truly embodies the essence of Hong Kong's unique festive traditions. Uh, welcome to Hong Kong. Uh, is it your first time here in the Fire Dragon Dance event? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. First time, yeah, yeah. Any of you have any thoughts? Like, what do you think? Uh? Um, I think it was really amazing. It was really also like exciting, and it looked like a lot of action. And uh, it, I'm just really grateful to be here. Yeah, I mean, there's so much life and energy around here. You know, the music, the drumming, people going around, helping each other out, everyone cheering, you know, all of us gathered here experiencing something totally new. It's wonderful. And this really 
is a great kind of cultural example of what I think makes Hong Kong and, and maybe Asia and, and China different from the West. It's so unique, it's so different. Uh, I really admire the people who are actually carrying the dragon because we got to try it and it's very heavy and it looks very dangerous when it's on fire. So all my respect, definitely. <laughs> The origin of the fire dragon dance dates back to the late 19th century. During that time, the village of Taihang was struck by a plague. In an effort to ward off the disease, the villagers created a dragon made of grass and filled it with incense sticks. They paraded and danced with the dragon throughout the village, hoping for the eradication of the plague. This custom has been passed down for over 140 years and has evolved into a festive event. In 2011, it was officially listed as a national intangible cultural heritage. Hello 就成熟的問題就是當時我們都很擔心的東西 To address the issue of cultural heritage preservation, a local NGO, in collaboration with the Taihang Residents Welfare Association, has organized fire dragon dance workshops led by Master Chang. These workshops aim to provide an opportunity for young participants to gain a deeper understanding and to inherit this intangible cultural heritage. We want to make sure that this tradition can actually be passed on to the next generation, and which is why we need to cast a wider net. And uh, we also set up a series of workshops to actually help the students learn more about the intangible cultural heritage and then also learn the actual dance itself. And also, you know, how the dragon is actually constructed out of you know, what they call the pearl grass. It's actually a very immersive way for um, the students to actually learn about this ICH because they are part of their ICH. Hi Hayden, hi Mavis. Well, can you tell us why are you here? Why do you participate in this workshop? Um, as this is an intangible cultural heritage that has been in Hong Kong for a long time and not like a lot of people know. So I think that as a Chinese in Hong Kong, I think that we should pay the effort to promote it to people, um, to foreigners as well. Uh, I think it's pretty fun because like, since uh, it's a part of my life, I would never like do stuff like this because like, we use too much social media and stuff these days and I pretty like it and I would like to do more dragon dancing. So what do you think as the next generation of Hong Konger the significance of preserving the intangible cultural heritage? I think that the cultural heritage itself, it forms the characteristics of our city and I think that it's very unique for us to um, own this type of culture. The Fire Dragon Dance event takes place over three consecutive nights during the Mid-Autumn Festival. As for the new generation of dragon descendants, they will showcase their hard work on the night of the Moon Chasing Festival. It's a great opportunity for everyone to immerse themselves in the festive atmosphere. Don't miss the chance to experience the celebration and cheer them on! From the Fire Dragon Dance to jewelry and watches, every item we covered in tonight's program is replete with age old stories. They have been passed down from one generation to the next, just like many of our customs and traditions.
This Sunday marks the 74th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Let me remind you again that the National Day fireworks display will take place over Victoria Harbor at 9 p.m. that evening. Many shopping malls will be extending their business hours and organizing various activities, as well as offering special deals to invigorate Hong Kong's nightlife scene. And if you're watching the fireworks in a public viewing area, remember to act in an orderly manner, mind your safety, and maintain cleanliness. Enjoy the long weekend, and see you next time.